The Oregon Holocaust Resource Center presents Glimpses of Lives Past. Oregonians remember pre-Nazi Europe. The people you are about to meet are all residents of Oregon and Washington. They live in neighborhoods similar to yours, and their grandchildren go to schools just like yours. These residents may seem to you like ordinary people with an ordinary past, but in fact, they are each survivors of an experience that changed their lives forever. These men and women witnessed firsthand the horrors of Nazi Germany. They were persecuted and uprooted from their homes because they were Jewish. They lost friends, families, and their own freedom, yet they somehow survived only they can tell us what it was really like to live through one of the worst episodes of the 20th century. I still have love in my heart and hope, believe in God, and believe in goodness and the goodness of people, and try not to, not to uh, fight hatred with hatred, uh, violence with violence. Where does it end? America is their home now, but it wasn't always so. These witnesses were born all across Europe. They were united in their Jewish heritage, but lived very different lives. Some came from big cosmopolitan cities like Vienna and Berlin. Others came from small rural communities in Poland and Hungary. A few enjoyed comfortable lives and were part of the political, cultural, and social world of their communities. Others had just enough for food and shelter. Growing up with the, in Vienna was really lots of fun. We had lots of music, theater. When I first started ice skating and skiing, I thought that was just wonderful. And Vienna is surrounded by beautiful woods, very similar to Portland. When I think back, we had a very good life. I was born in the island of Rhodes, which at that time belonged to Italy. Therefore, I was an Italian citizen, and so was my family. My parents, grandparents, everybody at home spoke Spanish. Imagine from hundreds and hundreds of years before, probably about 450 years or so, uh, they kept the, uh, their language because they never assimilated or integrated with other people. So really, we were self uh, self-contained everyone, so that the traditions, the everything was kept intact through those all those generations. We lived next door to each other in an area, I would say, of about uh, oh, 30, 40 blocks. And I was born in a little town in Germany called Freienol, in the uh, recreational part of the Ruhr River. Well, I lived in this great big wonderful house with my parents and my grandparents and a household help and of course my brother. Had a oh, wonderful family life. I remember very happy times, uh, walks in the woods on Sunday afternoons as it was customary during that time, meeting all our friends and playmates and so on, the village priest and some nuns perhaps with whom we were all very, very friendly. And uh, things were really quite, I would almost say, idyllic as far as my early childhood is concerned. The Jewish people in the city of Salonika, they live in Jewish ghetto type sections. Uh, we spoke Greek in the street and Ladino and Spanish at home in the neighborhood. So the one that I used to live, it was B Baron Hirsch. This was the name of the neighborhood. There was just like one main street. We had everything in the little street. It was approximately three blocks long. And we had everything you can name it in the street. So we kept pretty much to ourselves. We, we had practically everything we needed, but we were not rich. We couldn't afford, you know, trips or uh, 
luxury items, just enough to uh, survive. We really had a luxurious lifestyle, I have to say. As I look back over the old family pictures, I'm struck by how incredibly elegant my parents were. And I have memories of them going to the operas at night and my mother in beautiful long black dresses with a gorgeous diamond brooch. As we listen to the witnesses speak about the religious practices in their homes, you'll notice some were more observant and included many rituals. Others were less observant and religion did not play a major part in their lives. My mother was very religious. We kept kosher at our home, but we didn't go to, to services all the time. We went to services like about maybe a dozen times a year. I don't remember my father going with us because I don't think he knew how to read. My father, I do remember, he came home on Friday afternoon about, oh, it could have been three o'clock or so. Uh, he would uh, take a bath in the house or he would go to the Turkish bath and then went to the synagogue for, uh, see, we didn't have services in the evening. It was before sundown. Uh, they had uh, the service, and then he came home, and we ate uh, uh, a Sabbath dinner, which was uh, a very good dinner, always. The best was reserved for, the, for uh, Friday night and, and uh, Shabbat for Saturday morning, Saturday day. Then in the, he went early in the morning, he went to the synagogue. My father would say, um, pray in the morning, every morning, you know. We celebrated Friday night and Saturday and all this all the religious holidays. And we children went along until we were teenagers and started to rebel, of course, which all teenagers do. <laughs> there were, there were there's just Jewish kids there because the Jewish people had their own high school and their own grade school. We, would, we never went uh, to Greek schools, to the Christian Greek schools. Uh, Austria was a Catholic state, you know. I mean, Catholic, Catholicism is the religion. And the children were, in the morning, they were saying, we had, of course, uh, a picture of the Madonna and Jesus Christ was in every schoolroom hanging. Mm. And then the children, always in the morning, they had to say the prayers. And we Jewish children, they told us to just stay and hold our head down. But still, I, I never had any feeling that we are different, uh, you know, except it, your God, my God, you know. I never had that feeling. When Hitler became chancellor in 1933, the German Jews very quickly saw changes in their daily lives. Special laws called the Nuremberg Laws gradually stripped the Jews of their rights. Then the, the first real memory I have of that I was different was that we lived in an apartment building in Berlin. And when you walk down the stairs one morning, I saw posted a very large poster with a huge picture of a very ugly person with a huge hook nose. And he was holding a gun that was smoking. And on the ground below him was a heroic type of young person in a uniform with a swastika on his arm and the big caption above it so I guess I was old enough to read said I killed him because I am a Jew. Young German Jews immediately felt the impact of Nazism in the schools. Very often their teachers would ignore them and their classmates would bully them. Later no Jewish students were allowed to attend German public schools. A, a new teacher came to the to my class. He opened the door and took my books and uh, put me at the very last row in the in the classroom where there were empty rows. And from then on, uh, there was I I couldn't participate in the class at all if I. If he asked a question and I would raise my hand and nobody else would, he, he just totally ignored me like I wasn't there. 
In order to provide an alternative education for their children, parents sent them to Jewish day schools or to newly formed Jewish boarding schools. In such a protected setting, the Jewish children were spared, if only temporarily, from the harsh reality of Nazi Germany. I had a teacher who came to school in his Nazi uniform, in his brown shirt. And the minute he found out I was Jewish, he made me sit by myself. And again, I said to my parents, I can't go anymore. So my mother called this school in Kobach. It was a Jewish school, and we didn't suffer. And nobody told us anything. It was just wonderful. I really had a good time there, very happy time. It was just a, a wonderful atmosphere. And uh, we lived a very Jewish life there. We were so isolated from what was going on in the rest of Germany. It was, it was like we were in a, in, a, <laughs> in a little island. The first time I, I came home, my first thought was, oh, I'll have to run over to Maria and tell her all about what's happening in school. And, and I came to her door and her mother said, you can't come in. That hit me very hard because this girl uh, and I had been together, f you know, since I can remember. And we were, I considered her my closest friend. But I, I was a good swimmer when I was a child, very early. And so swimming was a big thing with me. And it was a place where I had learned how to swim and a place where in the summertime I went almost every single day. The man who took the tickets, I remember, he was someone I'd always known. And when I came and he knew me, he said, Sousa, I can't let you in. They won't let Jews come into this pool anymore. And I can remember looking around, you know, at the opening and seeing my friends inside and realizing that I couldn't go in. And I turned around and I walked back home again. And my mother was home and Detta was there. And I told them what had happened. And, um, it was a moment when I realized that my mother was so upset. I'm upset because I think about how upset my mother must have been. I mean, how upset you must be when you see your child come home and say, I couldn't go because I'm Jewish or I'm black or, you know, whatever. Austria was the first country to be annexed by Nazi Germany. It was called the Anschluss and took place in March 1938. The Jews of Austria now were subjected to the same discrimination laws as were the German Jews. As a matter of fact, I distinctly remember before the, uh, before the Anschluss, you know, there was a, a strong Austrian party and they painted slogans on the sidewalks, you know. And uh, then they rounded up people, old people, women, children, and made them come down and scrape those slogans off the sidewalk, you know, with the uh, toothbrushes and I mean they stood around there, you know, laughing and making jokes or even tossing water upon the people. The degradation, the humiliation, you know, people like uh, college professors, you know, uh, were taken down to wipe off those, or scrape off those slogans. Eight months later, on the night of November 9, 1938, organized riots known as Kristallnacht took place all over Germany and Austria. Synagogues were set afire, Jewish store windows were smashed, and many Jewish men were arrested and taken to concentration camps. Within a few weeks or months, most of them were released. But the terror they experienced there was enough for them to realize that there was no future for the Jews in Germany or Austria. November 9th, well 10th actually, 1938, Kristallnacht. When we were sitting at breakfast in the morning, children and teachers, all of a sudden we were told to line up and here were these uh, brown shirts again. And they ordered us to pick up any rocks that we could and smash the windows of our own school. And if you didn't do it, you know, they'd hold a, some kind of a knife or a, a gun or something to your head, regardless of whether you were a child or not, and they made you do it. Well, Kristallnacht was a very frightening experience. I mean, the mobs just moved through the streets. They just broke those windows, looted the stores, 
and uh, it was extremely fright frightening, you know, they torched, they torched our synagogue, they torched our temples. As a matter of fact, uh, I remember I did a stupid thing uh, when I think about it now. My, my father-in-law used to be a hunter. He used to go hunting and he had a hunting rifle there in his apartment. And then a group of Nazis came up there asking for weapons. And so I didn't know about this rifle. And after they left, I don't know what possessed me. I took that rifle and ran after them to give him the, give him the rifle. And my father came home on the 16th, and she, well, that was, I think, one of the biggest shocks. You know, he looked absolutely awful. They, he had been mistreated very much, so he was really physically and mentally, I would say, he was never again the same. Some families managed to leave Germany before Kristallnacht, but others were split up, and some members had to stay behind. Some countries were more willing to take in children than adults. The difficulty facing them now was to find another country that would accept them. Um, the decision was finally made in my family that my brother and I would go to the relatives in America, but that my parents would stay and that we would just wait for it to pass. My parents came with us and they brought us to Chicago. They had visitor's visas and they came all the way to Chicago and and stayed for about two months and then left. At that point, they had no choice. They did not have papers. It was, you know, it was very hard. The, the State Department was not very open to, to a large Jewish Im immigration, even though there were a lot of German Jews who made it. There were a lot who didn't, who tried. I mean, you know that people always say, well, how can you let them do that? You know, to all of you, just like, like, cattle to a slaughter. Well, there was a terrific pressure, terrific terror, you know. You didn't think right. Otherwise, today I can't understand it myself. There were millions of us. But there really wasn't much we could do about it. They had it organized, you know, in that, to a point where it was just like uh, slaughtering cattle. For those German and Austrian Jews who remained behind, a terrible fate awaited them. Millions of other European Jews were also trapped when the Germans invaded their countries.